Quebec will have to reckon with the way that their dead are being treated here, as this is very alarming. They were just children and they had their lives stolen. We started discovering very intimate links between Duplessis orphans and the way that Indigenous children were also treated. Puis là, le, le prêtre, puis le, le médecin nous a rentrés rentré dans, dans son char. Elle, elle nous a poussé dans un char qu'on qu peut embarquer. Puis moi, je ne voulais pas embarquer. Puis mon force c'est d'embarquer. Puis je, je pleurais tout le temps pour ma mère. Il a malade, puis le péché, puis le prêtre, il fait le crime, puis le rugueux, puis le voie maman. Ça rentre pas au paradis, ils vont aller aux enfants. Here in Joliet, Quebec, Rod Viennot lives where the railroad ends. If that sounds like a country and western song, well, that tracks. Every night you go to bed crying. Over the decades, Viennot has played countless shows and recorded five albums. Here he's playing along to a cover of a Vern Gosden song he recorded called that just about does it. That just about does it, don't it? The way Rod tells it, growing up, he didn't have much choice when it came to performing. My mother had used to make concerts, you know, and uh, I was young at the time, uh, you know, five or six years old, and she'd bring me there and everything else, and she had learned me some little songs and. I'd, I'd get up on a little uh, Coke box and a <laughs> Coca-Cola box to, to be able to sing, you know, a little song. It's tearing us apart to stay together. But then one day in the 1990s, everything changed. And Viano put music on the back burner. The impetus was a news program he saw on TV. These orphans here were talking, speaking about their that they had lost their lives and everything else, you know, their, their lives were stolen, taken away. And uh, my wife, she said, I'm one of them. This is uh, <clears throat> my wife, Clarina Duguay's uh, personal uh, uh, dossier. Clarina yeah. Duguay has been married to Vienno for over 50 years. But it took nearly 30 years for her to tell him she was a de Plessis orphan. Named after former Quebec Premier Maurice Duplessis, the term Duplessis orphan refers to children who in the late 1930s to mid-60s were moved from orphanages to psychiatric hospitals. But the vast majority had no mental illness. And many weren't even orphans in the true sense of the word. Ma mère a tombé malade, et le curé du village avec le médecin, il a ni voir mon père, puis il a dit à mon père, il dit, les deux petites filles vont être bien, avec les soeurs, vont se faire instruire. Puis là, le, le, le prêtre, puis le, le médecin nous a rentrés rentré dans, dans son char, elle, elle nous a poussés dans un char qu'on qu peut embarquer, puis moi, je ne voulais pas embarquer, puis mon force c'est d'embarquer, puis je, je pleurais tout le temps pour ma mère. Duguay had every reason to cry. She and her sister were taken to an orphanage hundreds of kilometers away. And all that crying made her stick out to one of the nuns at the Catholic-run orphanage. Her first night there was just the beginning of the abuse to come. I me levé, puis elle m'a emmené dans le bain pour prendre un bain de l'eau glacée. Puis elle a dit, lave-toi ici. Puis elle m'a fait agression sexuelle en bas. Et puis, j'ai pleuré toute la nuit. Duguay was nine years old. It was 1945, and in Quebec, the Catholic Church controlled education and social services. 
Their power in the province at the time is hard to overstate. In the early 1950s, Duplessis realized that federal subsidies paid $2.25 a day for mental patients versus 70 cents a day for orphans. He shortly thereafter collaborated with the church to wrongly classify thousands of orphans, in the terms of the day, as mentally retarded. This decades-long collusion between church and state in Quebec is known as la grande noisseur, the great darkness. They were just children and they had their lives stolen. When Duguay was 11 years old, she was told she was going to take a trip into town. Instead, she ended up in a mental institution on the outskirts of Quebec City. Needless to say, the conditions there weren't any better. Aside from physical and sexual abuse, Duguay never got a proper education. For years, her record wrongly said that she was mentally deficient. She is one of thousands of Duplessis orphans. The abuse she suffered is not unique. Some had it even worse. Paul Saint-Aubin was institutionalized and eventually lobotomized. He was physically abused, received electroshock treatment, and was given massive amounts of drugs. But perhaps the worst part is that the religious order that took in his unwed mother so she could give birth told her that Saint-Aubin had died. During the Great Darkness, it was considered a sin to give birth out of wedlock. The young girls were pregnant and they would have their babies there. St. Aubin was born in downtown Montreal in the now shuttered Seul de Misiacol Hospital. Seul de Misiacol translates as Sisters of Mercy, but their reputation during the Great Darkness says otherwise. After his unwed mother was told he died, St. Aubin was eventually sent to an orphanage. From there, he bounced around. At the age of 11, he was sent to work on a farm where he says he was abused. A fight with the farmer eventually landed him here, a Joliet mental hospital. But his mother never truly believed he died. In the 1980s, she found Saint Aubin after she did an access to information request. The nuns had named him Joseph Paul Forain, but kept his birthday the same. He was living in a halfway house in Joliet when his mother showed up at his door. According to Saint Aubin, once she saw his face, she knew it was him. Aside for a few years on the farm, Saint Aubin had spent his life in institutions, 35 years in total. But not long enough. They spent three years together before she died. But before she did, she made sure Paul's name was changed to St. Aubin, and that he got his rightful status as an Abenaki from the Wallenac First Nation. By coincidence, St. Aubin, Viennot, and Duguay ended up being neighbors. Around the time Viennot decided to replace his guitar with a protest sign. I thought I'd, you know, I'd get into that. I want to get justice. Along with other orphans, they organized protests, petitioned politicians, hired lawyers, complained to the Quebec Ombudsman. The end result? Nom du Québec et de son gouvernement, je leur exprime nos plus sincères excuses. In 1999, Quebec Premier Lucien Bouchard apologized and offered the orphans three million dollars. In 2001, the orphans came to an agreement with Quebec, $10,000 per orphan plus $1,000 per year spent in a mental institution. Claire-Lina Duguay was paid $15,000. She and any other orphans who signed were required to waive their rights to future litigation against the religious orders and government. Perhaps most infuriating for the orphans, the church has never apologized or offered to pay compensation, despite there being other precedents. Over in the, in the United States, they were all paid out. Viano has a point. In 2003, the Boston Archdiocese paid out $85 million to victims of sexual abuse. 
More recently in New Jersey, the diocese coughed up 87 million for hundreds of victims, a fraction of the at least 3,000 suspected Duplessis orphans. The Boston settlement included funding for counseling, and the New Jersey victims also received apologies. This is the uh, L'Orphelino St. George, the St. George Orphanage. Technically, this is where the St. George's Orphanage used to be. Sino Ben says he spent some time here after the farm. Now all that remains is this giant cross. When asked what he remembers of this place, he doesn't hold back. And so, the battle continues. In 2023, a proposed class action was struck down by the Supreme Court. But this past May, a breakthrough. The Seul de la Charité and Quebec City's health authority recently settled with orphans from the Mont Duville orphanage for 65 million. So hope remains that some of the religious orders behind the Duplessis orphans might still have to pay. Vino adds that over the years he has met about two dozen other indigenous Duplessis orphans. Aside from Saint Aubin, Epitin was able to confirm three others, all Algonquin from the Kitigan ZB area. It's one of the rare lists that we have of uh, the locations of uh, indigenous people uh, in uh, mental hospitals. Meanwhile, new information has come to light that there may be more. We started discovering very intimate links between Duplessis orphans and the way that indigenous children were also treated. Hervé Bertrand learned how to play this song nearly seven decades ago at the Mont Providence Orphanage. La chanson importante pour le Mont Providence, j'appelle ça l'hymne national du Mont Providence. He and other orphans would be enlisted to sing it for visiting dignitaries. Bertrand says he once performed for a cardinal. J'ai jamais appris à lire la musique. J'apprenais toutes les notes par cœur dans ma tête. The lyrics celebrate God's care of his followers. For example, bestow upon us in abundance all good things here below. The thing is, little good was bestowed to young Bertrand at the Mont Providence orphanage. Quite the opposite. He was forced to work unpaid for long hours as a child and was deprived of an education after being wrongfully classified as mentally deficient. Comme de jour avant, une soeur me le dit, a dit but the most traumatic incident happened when a monitor cornered 16-year-old Bertrand in a stalled elevator. During Karim, the sisters promenaded in the edifice and sang religious songs. They called them the Psalms. The Psalms they sang were something like. La 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 la, au rapronobis. Puis toute la durant deux trois heures, ils se promènent dans le passage. Puis ça a pris le, je sais pas que ce qui pris là, au rapronobis. Puis lui durant ça là là, il, il m'enculait. Puis à chaque fois qu'il disait au pronobis, il me rentrait ça au fond. The rape was so bad, Bertrand had to get surgery on his rectum. He was sent to another mental institution in the east end of Montreal to get an operation and recover the notorious saint jean de dieu Hospital, where lobotomies and other experimental treatments were regularly being performed. Long since rebranded, the former saint jean de dieu Hospital still stands, but the cemetery down the hill is long gone. In its place is the headquarters for Quebec's Liquor Commission, known as the SAQ. In May, Bertrand and a small group of orphans gathered here to protest a warehouse expansion. But they weren't alone. Quebec will have to reckon with the way that their dead are being treated here, as this is very alarming. 
Gataneta Horn is a longtime activist and currently a spokesperson for a group called the Mohawk Mothers. She says she's here to not only support the orphans, but also because she suspects among the dead possibly buried nearby are indigenous children. Certainly in our communities we have uh, missing children. We've known about that because our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents told these stories to us. There's a great concern and worry uh, that if no search dogs are, are brought on the site, human remains will be desecrated and, and potentially uh, destroyed. Philippe Luin is an anthropologist and PhD candidate at McGill University. He's advocating on behalf of the Duplessis orphans and Mohawk mothers regarding the warehouse expansion dispute. These are the remains that were found in 1975 when the SAQ built its first warehouse. This is the official list of the people who were buried there, more than 2,000 people. Known as the Pixty Cemetery due to its proximity to a pig farm, the discovery of the mass grave made headlines. And while the remains from that dig have been moved to another site, the orphans and Mohawk mothers suspect there are more on this empty lot earmarked for expansion right next to where the mass grave was found. It's very hard to, you know, assess whether this uh, is accurate or not. Is this a full list? There's some anonymous children. The SAQ had the land examined by experts who dug trenches and found animal bone fragments, but no human remains. But the Canadian Archaeological Association weighed in on the dispute saying cadaver dogs should be brought in to make sure. The SAQ has declined, and the orphans have since responded with a cease and desist letter. So this is a letter from a doctor at the Allen Memorial Institute asking for the list of institutions where uh, Indigenous people are hospitalized for mental illness. Meanwhile, Luan's research shows that there might be something to the Mohawk mother's oral history of missing kids. This list from 1964 shows dozens of Indigenous patients spread out all over Quebec, many in mental institutions that held Duplessis orphans. We found some very compelling uh, pieces of evidence um, uh, of the transfers of children, how it happened, especially in the, in the 50s and 60s, uh, while the Duplessis orphan era uh, was ongoing. He was deemed to be uh, undisciplined, this boy. They sent him to Mont Saint-Antoine. Luin says child protection laws were used to grab kids who weren't in residential or day schools. His research shows that Indigenous children who didn't attend school for three consecutive days could be declared juvenile delinquents and incarcerated. It was a official policy that these children were wards of the state. They were a state property. Uh, the state could do whatever they wanted with them. Luen's research also found a 1956 mention of 120 so-called difficult children being treated with new drugs in Montreal and being kept for observation as well as a 1963 study of 92 Mohawk children from Ganawage, just south of Montreal. The study references a previous report that refers to Mohawk children as a social problem, and its findings come to a similar conclusion, calling Mohawk children less ready to identify with human society and therefore a social risk. I am dropping you a few lines to let you know that I want my daughter to take her out from that prison place. Bluin is reading from a 1953 letter a Mi'kmaq woman wrote to a social worker asking for her daughter to be sent home. The mother's request is refused. Bluin says the inherent ethnocentrism of Canada made the institutionalization of Indigenous children not only acceptable, but desirable. And so this intersected with um, current uh, searches uh, in Quebec for Indigenous children who were lost in the healthcare system. Bluin is referring to the ongoing investigation into Quebec's ghost babies, the name for at least 199 Indigenous children who went missing after being placed in a Quebec institution before 1992. The search is aided by a provincial law passed in 2021, loosening access to information laws for Indigenous families to look for missing kids. Si Violetta a été est vraiment décédée, ben c'est de savoir où elle a été inhumée. But the law has its limitations, especially if you happen to be an orphan. 
The problem with the current legislation is that children who don't have uh, an immediate family, uh, their records cannot be accessed by anyone. In the United States, uh, records become available after 50 years. In Canada, uh, many records, it's, uh, it takes 100 years, so it's really after no one is alive anymore and no one can be prosecuted. So, is there a smoking gun linking missing Indigenous kids and Duplessis orphans? Not yet. But the similarities of how vulnerable children of all ethnicities were treated in Quebec's great darkness are obvious. Following his stay at Saint Jean de Dieu, Bertrand ended up in a reform school. Which he describes as a picnic compared to the orphanage. He became a plumber and built a life for himself. He eventually received 20,000 from Quebec for being a Duplessis orphan. Now at the age of 81, he still advocates for orphans and he's found some peace with God. Recently, through DNA testing in Ancestry.com, Bertrand was able to track down some relatives who tell him his mother was Abenaki, although that remains to be confirmed. Back in Joliet, Viano, Duguay and Saint-Aubin are waiting on what's likely their final legal attempt to hold the Catholic religious orders accountable. Viano wants financial restitution for orphans before it's too late. They would live their lives and have a, you know, a bit of happiness before passing away. APTN Investigates reached out to several religious orders involved in this story. None responded to our request for interview, but they are still active. For instance, the Sisters of Miziakald, who ran the hospital where St. Aubin was born, are on the board for this daycare center bearing their name. The daycare's mandate? To help single mothers. As for St. Aubin, he takes life day by day. He likes to ride his bike, and it's proud that despite it all, he looks young for his 72 years. The trip of the Saint Aubin may be aiming to live a long life, but will he, or any Duplessis orphan, live long enough to hear an apology from the Catholic Church? God only knows.